All right. Um, yeah, thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Rafael Robert, and today I'll be speaking about messaging layer security, or MLS for short. Um, and um, given that we have about half an hour, this is going to be a relatively broad and, and high level overview of what MLS is. Um, and then in the questions, we can dive a little deeper uh, because there are so many ramifications this could take. So messaging layer security. Um, on one hand, it's the name for a new protocol for end-to-end -end encrypted messaging. And at the same time, it is now also an ITF working group. Uh, it's been that for a bit over two years now. Um, and so the big question that hopefully we can answer a bit today is why, why is this important now? Why do we need a new protocol for messaging again? There are already many out there with good security properties and that have already been deployed in other production systems. As mentioned, I'm Rafa Robert. I'm head of security. I work for WIRE. And I've been involved with MLS uh, quite a bit since the beginning. So these are the other institutions and companies that um, have been involved with MLS. Of course, it's not all of them. There's uh, many more now. Um, so you see it's a, it's a mix between the industry, um, some bigger players there, but uh, also a number of academic institutions, which I think is very important to have this balance uh, between the industry that, that knows particularly well what the needs of, of users are and, and how engineering can be done, but then also academia who um, can really make sure that uh, things are as secure as they're actually claimed to be. Um, and we've seen numerous times in the past that that's not always the case. So it's very important to um, have this balance between these two uh, poles, essentially. So a very brief overview of what the, the current status is in, uh, in secure messaging. Of course, that's not exhaustive in any way. We have a lot of messaging apps today. You uh, probably use a number of them, if not all of them, maybe even. Um, they have a lot in common in the sense that they try to solve similar challenges. Um, but there are also big difference in the sense that they use uh, different protocols that are similar to a certain extent but offer different details when it comes to security uh, guarantees. Uh, also the, the level of analysis is very different uh, for these apps uh, and most of them maintain their own libraries. They don't really share code uh, between each other. And a quick overview of the security properties we've had in the past. Uh, this is really a gross simplification. Um, and I've, I've picked the, the most important things here. So from the 90s, we know PGP, encrypted email, um, which gave us confidentiality and authenticity, which is the absolute baseline these days. Um, and then there has been some tremendous work from uh, the of the record protocol group, um, and which uh, keeps on happening still. And so that gave us uh, forward secrecy and deniability. Um, again, this is a high level overview. There are many nuances to these terms. Um, and then we saw the, the double ratchet algorithm uh, that's the foundation of the signal protocol. Um, and uh, that gave us asynchronous communication. Um, and also a notion of future secrecy, which, as you all know, is usually referred to as post-compromise security in academia. And obviously, there is still some room to, to add other security guarantees here. So one of the questions is, what, what happens to groups? Because all of the protocols from the past are typically about one-to-one -one communication. And uh, groups have been a little bit neglected in that sense. So um, what you do in one-to-one, -one, you cannot just extrapolate that to a group. Um, so the way you, you tackle the group um, problem these days can either be by superposing uh, these one-to-one -one channels uh, between multiple participants and then say, this is not a group. Um, 
The problem there is that scalability is not a given at all because you end up having a lot of connections between all of the participants. Um, so if you want better scalability, you have to tone down the security properties you get. Uh, and I'll get to that uh, later a little bit. So you end up having to choose uh, a trade-off between security properties and the scalability you can expect. And um, so you, you might ask, of course, um, you know, we want security properties, so why do we care about scalability so much? So I think right now this is the best example. We are having uh, this conference over Zoom for scalability reasons. Um, so if we, if we want good security properties to be deployed uh, broadly, we need to take care of scalability. So this is an illustration in a group with a pairwise protocol, you end up having uh, a lot of connections. So what that means is you need to keep a lot of state on the endpoints, you have increased payload, you have more cryptographic operations happening on the endpoints. So if you have mobile phones, uh, you might run into bottlenecks there effectively because you're not always in a position to send megabytes worth of payload and, and you cannot uh, do as many crypto operations as you wish. So there's another aspect um, to just using pairwise protocols to create uh, groups, and that is that uh, typically what's being studied is the actual pairwise protocol. Um, what's typically not being studied is how concrete messengers uh, turn, use them within groups. So there is a layer that is relatively well understood, um, also in academia. And then there is a completely proprietary layer for the group management um, that is very different in different messengers. So going back to the, the scaling um, versus the security properties, if we try to put that on a very simple chart, we have email encryption as my PGP. So this doesn't have modern security properties and it also doesn't scale very well. Um, so it would be at the lower left corner. Um, then we have client fan out. So this typically has more modern security properties that vary a bit. Um, and then as a compromise, we have this concept called sender keys uh, that is used in WhatsApp, Facebook messengers uh, and, and others. Um, so they're still better than just the baseline security uh, in that sense, but they're, they're not as good as the, the client fan out one-to-one uh, -one approach, but they scale a little better. So the question is, what, what could we have in the upper right corner here? So if we are to design a new protocol, um, what, and, and we have the luxury to do it from scratch, and, and that was indeed the case for uh, MLS, what would be the objectives um, so that we get good security properties, but also solve real life problems for existing messengers. So if you go to the drawing board, one of the security properties we don't have because so far we've only had one-to-one -one protocols mostly is membership authentication. Um, in, in the one-to-one -one relationship, you, you don't really care at that level of who's in the group, but it would be very nice to um, have a strong guarantee that everybody sees the same number of participants in the group and everybody has the same view on the group and uh, has a tight grip on who can join and who cannot. So this would be nice to extend the list of uh, security properties we have here. So on the more functional side, um, there's a number of things that are very important for real life deployments of secure messaging. One is the fact that a protocol should be asynchronous, which means that there shouldn't ever be a situation where two members have to be online at the same time. Um, this is not intuitive, this, this is annoying and from a user's perspective if this is a requirement. Um, there's one example I think on the secret uh, chats in Telegram, this is the case when you initiate one of those, you have to wait for the other party to come online first until you can actually text them. 
Um, so this creates friction that, that we actually don't want uh, for messaging. Because a user doesn't typically doesn't want to uh, bother with security. It should just be there, it should just work. Um, but they, the average user doesn't, doesn't want to see that all the time. We already spoke about group messaging. So uh, one, one goal should really be to support large and also dynamic groups. It's important that the, uh, the, there can be new joiners and people who leave the group uh, all the time and that this still works efficiently and also gives us good security guarantees in such a dynamic life cycle of a group. We also want multi-device support. Um, so PGP was great in the 90s when everybody uh, had at most a desktop PC, but now we have a, many devices um, and it's completely natural to have messaging on more than one of them. And we also expect stuff to be synchronized among them. So this is definitely something uh, we wanna have for modern messaging. Also federation, um, this is still something that um, is relatively new. I mean, there, there has been federation for uh, non-secure messaging in the past. Um, the idea here is that a messaging protocol shouldn't limit the applications uh, you can have in the context of a federated environment. So if there's any question, federation in that context means um, that you can have more than one organization uh, maintaining more than one server and these servers are interconnected and a user from organization A can uh, send a message to a user from organization B. And last but not least, the whole thing should actually be usable. So this is very important. Um, uh, there's a lot of, of great ideas and great design about how to achieve really advanced security properties, but it's it's actually important that you can incorporate a protocol uh, into existing applications without completely changing the user experience, without adding additional requirements of what users have to do, etc., uh, or make assumptions that are simply not realistic. What else do we want? Um, it would be nice to have an open standard. Um, where everybody can contribute, first of all, uh, in the design phase and, and uh, express criticism, etc., and have an iterative process. Um, and, and of course, the outcome of that should be that the, the specification should be usable by anyone. Uh, code reuse would also be nice. So this is what we uh, have in TLS, for example, and uh, TLS has actually been something uh, the MLS group has, has looked at a lot um, for a number of reasons. So with TLS these days, it's um, you don't write your own TLS library. Typically, you pick one uh, that's already there. It would be nice if we could do the same for messaging. And as I already said earlier, uh, it is absolutely crucial to have the involvement from the academic community for the security analysis. We saw that in recently in TLS 1.3 um, and uh, I think this is simply the future when it comes to these really critical um, protocols um, that this uh, interaction is there right away. All right, let's speak a bit more concretely about MLS. Um, so I just saw that it's been mentioned in the past talks as well. Uh, which is great. So going back to TLS, uh, TLS has a, a clearly defined scope. We have a transport layer and then we have message content. Um, and TLS fits in between the two. So it adds a security layer between the transport and the actual message content. Um, and then it defines one interface for authentication. So we all know that as certificates in the case of TLS, but strictly speaking, uh, TLS really only defines the interface here. It doesn't really care about how the authentication works and if there is a PKI behind it or if it's you know, self-signed certificates or whatever. It, it stops at this interface. 
And so the idea was to do something very similar for MLS. So here as a baseline, we start with a transport encryption layer, um, typically TLS. Then we have an application layer. So these are actual text messages or anything you want to send uh, in the context of, of messengers, files, pictures, uh, audio messages, etc. And, and the idea is to plug MLS right in between these two and have a similar interface for the authentication service, uh, which is defined in the MLS protocol, but how the authentication service works is clearly beyond the scope. And so the broad architecture of MLS, uh, as I just mentioned, there's an authentication service, which is very abstract in the sense uh, that there is only a few definitions on what this authentication service should actually provide. But again, how it works is out of the scope for MLS. Um, there's also a delivery service. The so name says the delivery service is there to deliver actual messages from A to B. And so the requirements for the delivery service are even slimmer. Um, actually pretty much boils down to a service that is capable of transporting messages, can order certain messages, um, and can uh, also deliver uh, so-called key packages, which are a little bit like pre-keys in the signal protocol. But beyond that, it's not defined how it works. And then the, the protocol itself um, has the notion of a group, so an MLS. Um, Everything is a group and, and MLS describes what happens within that group and how the group evolves over time, what operations are, et cetera. And groups contain several users that can have several clients. Um, and of course, you could have several groups. So this is a slide um, that I'm clearly reusing. So I think for this audience, I don't have to go into details how forward secrecy and post compromise security work um, in detail. I know that. Um, the core algorithm of MLS is currently TreeChem. Um, in, the, in the very early phase, we looked at a number of options uh, from very simple ones to really advanced ones like um, the asynchronous ratcheting trees, which I think was a big inspiration for TreeCam. In the meantime, um, I just saw that in the other talk, um, there have been other proposals for TreeCam, other variations or improvements, et cetera, um, that, that also have been discussed that add some additional security properties, but also come at a certain cost um, of either flexibility or payload or number of operations you have to do, et cetera. So within the ITF working group, the consensus is still to stick with TreeCam. Um, this could change in future iterations, of course. I'm not gonna explain how TreeCam works, um, but uh, on a very broad level, we have binary trees and we have all the members of a group at the leaf level of the trees. And then we have intermediate nodes uh, that can be calculated uh, by the clients, uh, by the members of the group and um, there is one uh, secrecy invariant, uh, which is a core of TreeCam. Um, so this has proven to be a very flexible concept, which uh, has uh, where we've been able to change certain details over time uh, in order to achieve um, what we wanted to uh, in terms of operations, etc. So now I want to talk about efficiency briefly. Um, regarding scalability, obviously. So in the case of pairwise sending, uh, obviously the order of magnitude is uh, proportional to the number of members of a group. So if you send a message in, in over a pairwise protocol in a group, you're gonna uh, send it to each of the recipients uh, individually, or if they have multiple devices, then you even encrypt it to all of their devices individually. Um, with sender keys, I mentioned that earlier for those who are not familiar with the notion. Um, this is simplifying things a little bit in that um, a sender first sends a symmetric key to everybody else and then uses that key to encrypt messages that can be found out by a server. So this has the advantage that not every, literally every text message needs to be sent n times 
uh, you only do that for the setup when you send that key. And then you can send out a message in O of one and you let the server do the work of fanning it out to the clients. So this is a little better. Most of the time, not all of the time, you, you're still dependent on O of N. Uh, the, the problem is that if members leave, then everybody else has to fan out or to send out an, a new key um, to the remaining members of the group. And this is where it gets really expensive. And that's exactly where you, you see this trade-off. You can also say that you don't want to do that for efficiency reasons, but then you get fewer security guarantees, obviously. Um, so post-compromise security um, uh, is where what you have a problem with um, at that point. So in, in concrete terms, since we have binary trees, uh, most of the time we can do things in log of n because we only traverse a tree from the leaf to the root. Um, and to just to give you uh, an example with relatively uh, high numbers, if you have a group of up to, up to 100,000 members and you want to send a message uh, that has the size of one kilobyte, so in a pairwise protocol, you end up having a payload of 100 megabytes that you would have to send out uh, from exactly one client. Um, of course, uh, 100,000 members is very large for a group. This is not the, the average size of a group, but um, it becomes clear that this is not doable, say, on an old Android phone on a 2G network. Uh, this is just not going to work. Um, the same example with MLS. Um, since it's logarithmic, uh, you only have 17 operations, and you, you would send out 17 kilobytes. And this is definitely doable even on older phones on slow networks. Um, so if we compare the one-to-one -one client fan out with sender keys with MLS in terms of efficiency, the idea is that MLS um, is at least as good as others, um, but typically better. So depending on, on what operations you have, uh, these all relate to group of operations where you create a group, you add people to the group, you update key material, you remove people from the group, and finally you send a message. Um, so a lot of that uh, can either be done in O of 1, like adding uh, people and sending out messages, or somewhere between log of n and n, depending on how many of the intermediate nodes of the tree uh, have already been populated. Um, and, and that depends on, on how frequently existing members send update messages. There's also another aspect of uh, metadata protection. Um, so um, the content is, is of course uh, confidential because of the end-to-end -end encryption. But there are always metadata, uh, and that's a much harder problem to tackle. Uh, and the question is, what, what can we do here? What should we protect in addition to the actual message content? And so we can classify metadata into um, two categories. One is observable metadata, and the other category would be persistent metadata. Observable metadata is something like an attacker sitting on a network and looking at packets. And so by design, this is sort of out of scope for a protocol like MLS. Um, simply because you cannot solve it at that level. You have to apply changes to the overall architecture, like using mixed nets, onion routing, etc. Then you can do something about observable metadata, but you can do something about persistent metadata. And this is also what we're trying with MLS. We um, have a message that is encrypted in multiple layers. Um, so servers typically keep messages in queues when they deliver them. Um, and we can encrypt some of that metadata. For example, we can encrypt who the sender of the message is because the server doesn't really need to know that, just needs to put the message into the right queue. And then the client who is, is going to uh, receive the message in the end cares about who the sender is, but the client also has a key material to decrypt that. So we can obfuscate that on the whole uh, transport route, like network and, and server, etc. We also have the uh, option to have uh, padding so that we can uh, make messages look indistinguishable from each other in terms of size. So we have this layered model where it's still a little bit in flux, but um, so the message itself is completely protected in that sense. The padding 
takes care of the size and the, the headers um, are reduced. Uh, I think currently uh, you can only see to what group that message belongs um, and uh, what the, the current epoch is, how far that group has advanced. But there are also some ideas to obfuscate that even further. I already mentioned federation. Um, so the idea is that MLS is fundamentally compatible with federation in the sense that it doesn't have requirements that completely prohibit federation. Of course, in order to achieve practical federation, you need a lot more than just a, a messaging protocol. You also need a protocol between the servers, etc. This is out of scope for MLS. Um, right now, I already mentioned it earlier for the delivery service. There's the requirement that that delivery service will order handshake messages, which is a, one of the types of messages that are being sent uh, to organize groups in MLS. And so if we can distribute this ordering problem across servers, then essentially um, we can do federation with MLS. So if we have multiple delivery services, we just need to see which one of them is actually gonna order messages and, and the other delivery services will literally just route messages that's all they need to do. And there can be two approaches. One would be where you simply designate which one of the delivery services is responsible for ordering the messages. And there could be a more advanced um, approach with more redundancy where the, the ownership uh, could be passed on between the delivery services. So that if one of the nodes goes down, uh, that you can still keep on messaging. I want to do a very brief stint into business messaging because um, it's in order for something to become really ubiquitous, it also needs to solve that particular thing. So uh, there's a lot of change when it comes to business messaging, which didn't even really exist until recently, uh, until users actually had um, you know smartphones that they brought to work and they're used to messaging uh, other people in a private context and they expect to have the same experience. Uh, at work, um, and so this has really uh, become a thing. Um, and this also needs to be protected. Obviously, businesses want to protect the information there. Um, and the biggest challenge they've had is to actually encrypt things meaningfully. So the um, the current the status quo is that um, there is no end-to-end -end encryption for business messaging at a very large scale currently. Uh, because of that scalability problem. So the the baseline here is TLS, where messages are being protected between clients and servers, but then they're not necessarily encrypted on servers. Um, so this, this is where MLS um, becomes important because of the scalability. There's also other things that do not exist in consumer messaging as problems. Businesses sometimes have the need to um, have retention of messages for compliance reasons. Um, so this is another thing you want to achieve with a protocol. And um, then there is the, the feature challenge. Um, so email is still very popular because you can reach absolutely everybody over email. Everybody has an email address, whether that's an individual or a business. Um, and, and one of the reasons is because email is federated and that's why it works so well. So this is definitely something, even though it's a, an incredibly old technology and can be criticized in many ways, it's still there uh, and there's, there's a lesson to be learned from that fact. And this is where federation comes in, obviously, uh, when it comes to MLS. So um, summary is that um, the idea is that MLS aims to be a new standard for secure messaging and especially in large groups with modern security properties as we've seen and the whole thing should be robust, usable and also an open specification. And ideally this could be used for new solutions but also um, for existing products that for example previously did not have any end-to-end -end encryption support. There is a website where you can find the current link to the current ITF docs. Um, it's called messaging layer security rocks. So it's a good entry point. There is an, an ITF mailing list for 
uh, MLS, obviously, as well. Um, and so we, like I said, we started MLS uh, a bit more than two years ago in the working group. We are, we've made a lot of progress. Um, and so the next step is to get to a state where we can uh, have a last call, essentially, on things we want to have in this first iteration of MLS, uh, and then um, give academia a bit of time to uh, analyze things a little further. Um, but we should soon be able to freeze the protocol uh, enough, and so we're we're quite advanced in that sense. So that concludes my talk for today. Thank you very much for listening, and now I can take some questions. <laughs>